So, the lecture this evening will be based substantially upon the book that Tim mentioned, Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism. It will be appropriate to make a few brief remarks about the book by way of introduction. First, I should stress that I didn't intend to write this book. Being only a humble student and an admirer of Buddhism from afar, uh, it wouldn't have occurred to me to have undertaken such an ambitious aim as to try and disclose the common ground between these two global traditions. So the Common Ground Project was actually initiated by His Royal Highness Prince Ghazi bin Muhammad of Jordan, who was himself responding to an invitation by the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama to organize a conference of scholars from the two traditions to engage in dialogue on Buddhist-Muslim relations. And so I was asked to actually prepare a kind of pre-conference paper outlining some of the avenues that could be explored more deeply and hopefully fruitfully by the scholars. I did this most enthusiastically and uh, I was then asked by Prince Razi to expand the paper into a short book which might obviate the need for a conference if the Dalai Lama and his team of scholars read the book and approved of the basic arguments um, and this is what happened. The principal arguments in the book were accepted by the team of scholars that the Dalai Lama asked to read the book and therefore he wrote a foreword to it in which he said the, the following. My Muslim friends have explained to me that since God is characterized as compassionate and merciful, faithful Muslims are actually offering complete submission to the ideal of universal compassion. And he concludes this particular paragraph with the important affirmation. Thus, from a Buddhist point of view, the practice of Islam is evidently a spiritual path of salvation. In making this statement, the Dalai Lama was helping us to fulfill one of the aims behind the writing of the book, that Buddhists might come to recognize Islam as what they would call a dharma, or a path to salvation. As for the converse aim, enabling or encouraging Muslim recognition of Buddhism as an authentic deen or a religion, this aim was pursued not in the domains of formal Islamic theology or jurisprudence, but on the grounds of spirituality and mysticism. My hope was that an exposition of the similarities, resonances and affinities between the two traditions on the level of what is called ma'rifa in Islam, spiritual wisdom, might enable theologians and jurists to see that despite the vast and innumerable differences between the two traditions of Islam and Buddhism on the level of formal creed and ritual action, there's nonetheless sufficient common ground on the level of spirituality and morality to warrant respect of Buddhists because of their religion and not despite their religion. In other words, I was hoping that this book might make it easier for Muslims to see that Buddhists are in fact following something like Islam. Using this word like in the spirit of the Quranic verse, and if they believe in the like of that which ye believe, then they are rightly guided. Verse 137 of Surah Al-Baqarah. I was therefore gratified that in his preface to the book, Professor Hashim Kamali, one of the leading scholars of Islamic jurisprudence, supports the arguments made in the book to recognize Buddhists as being akin to the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book, those who follow a divine revelation. It might be asked, are we justified in making this distinction between spiritual wisdom, ma'arifa, and theology? Kalam. I'd respond in the affirmative insofar as one's aim is the cultivation of an intuition of ultimate reality rather than an explication of the formal creed giving expression to this reality. According to Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, upon whose mystical insights I relied most of all in the book, the science of Kalam is restricted in its scope to the outward aspects of the formal creed, the Aqidah. It cannot attain spiritual knowledge of God, quote, his, 
qualities and his acts. Theology, he argues, is in fact more like, quote, a veil, obscuring this knowledge. The only way, he says, to attain this ma'rifa, spiritual knowledge, is through inner efforts, mujahada, which God has established as the prelude to integral guidance. This is on the Book of Knowledge in the Ihya. This inner effort, purification of the soul and illumination of the heart, is already something that most Buddhists would recognize as the prelude to integral guidance. But now let's address the major issue dividing the two traditions, the respective ways of referring to this ultimate reality, and ask the question, did the Buddha teach a doctrine that can be called non-theistic or atheistic? And if it can be called non-theistic, how does this help to reveal common ground between Buddhism and the heavily theistic tradition of Islam? I argue that the ultimate reality affirmed by the Buddha is nothing other than what monotheists refer to as God, more precisely in Islamic terms, to the essence of God, that Allah. So we might usefully begin with this teaching of the Buddha from one of the earliest scriptures of the Pali Canon, the Udana 80 to 81. There is, O monks, an unborn, not become, not made, uncompounded, a samskrita. And were it not, O monks, for this unborn, not become, not made, not compounded, no escape could be shown here for what is born, has become, is made, is compounded. But because there is, O monks, an unborn, not become, not made, uncompounded, therefore an escape can be shown for what is born, has become, is made, is compounded. It seems clear in this citation that the ultimate reality called Allah in the Qur'an corresponds metaphysically to that which is described by the Buddha as uncompounded, what we might call in Islamic theology basit, as opposed to murakkab, unborn, not made, not become. The unborn and not become can be understood to refer to a reality or an essence which, being above and beyond the temporal condition, is perforce the cause of that condition. It's from this not become that all becoming originates. Now all the stress in early Buddhism is on the need to escape to the not made, rather than asserting the causal role of the not made in relation to what is. One might ask, why is it that this ultimate reality is not described as a creator, as the creator? And to answer this question, we need to appreciate the Buddhist notion of upaya, skillful means, a skillful means of communicating that which in essence is beyond words. The Buddha refused to speak of the origin of the process of interdependent causation, pratitya samutpada, that process by which the compounded elements come together in reciprocal causality in the world that we see around us. This is because his upaya was not concerned with describing the world of relativity, but rather escaping from this world to the Absolute. This mode of teaching can be better understood by reference to the specific nature of the environment in which the Buddha was promulgating his message. The Quran tells us, and we never sent a messenger save with the language of his people, so that he might make it clear to them. Verse 4, Surah 14. The language of the Buddha's people must be understood in the wider sense of the religious and cultural context of India in his time. According to certain sources, this context was defined by a largely pharisaical, formalistic, brahmanical culture wherein one of the chief obstacles to effective salvation was a preoccupation with the putatively eternal nature of the soul. The transcendence of the absolute self, paramatman, was lost sight of amid 
the formulaic and one-sided assertions of the immanence of the absolute self in the relative self, the jivatman. The result being a diminution of a sense of the utter otherness, the transcendence of the absolute self vis-à-vis the relativity of the human self. In other words, immanence had trumped transcendence. The immortality of the soul was confused with the eternity of the absolute. Moreover, in the Buddha's time, the question of the creation and origination of the cosmos had become more a source of speculative distraction than constructive elucidation. Skillful means of communication required that one concentrate on escaping from the illusions of the world to the reality beyond the world. This is very clearly expressed in the following teaching of the Buddha. This is from the Majjhima Nikaya, the so-called middle-length discourses. Suppose Malankya Putta, a man, were pierced with an arrow well steeped in poison, and his close friends and relatives were to summon a physician. Suppose then the man says, I will not have this arrow pulled out until I know of the man of whom I was pierced, his name, his clan, whether he's tall or short or middle stature, till I know whether he's black or dark or sallow-skinned, whether he be from such and such a village, a suburb or a town. I will not have the arrow pulled out until I know of the bow by which I was pierced, whether it was a longbow or a crossbow. Such questioning continues in this teaching in regards to all sorts of details about the arrow. Then the Buddha concludes, Well, Malankya Putta, that man would die, but still the matter would not have been found out by him. This one-pointed focus on the need to overcome ignorance, delusion and suffering meant that the Buddha refused to answer questions which would only further entrench the ignorance he was soaking to dispel. What he was silent about, however, he did not deny. Quite to the contrary, the need to escape from the suffering attendant upon attachment to the perishing world was predicated on the eternal and blissful nature of ultimate reality, a reality that cannot be adequately expressed in words, a reality which, according to the Buddha, transcends all name and form, nama rupa. Here we observe a resonance with a key aspect of Islamic belief. The essence of Allah strictly transcends all attributes, such that it cannot be adequately conceived, let alone described. That it is can be conceived, but what it is cannot. Just as the Buddha refers to the absolute or non-compound, the asamskrita, such an important concept in this discourse, as being beyond name and form, as being the shunya, the void, beyond all thought, so in Islam, it is only the attributes of God and not the divine essence that can be conceived of and meditated upon. In this connection, it's relevant to refer to the following definition of the Quranic term fikr or tafakkur, meditation, reflection, by the authoritative lexicographer of the Quran, Ar-Raghib al-Isfahani. Fikr, meditation or reflection, he writes, is only possible in regard to that which can assume a conceptual form, surah, in one's heart. Thus, he says, we have the following saying of the Prophet, وسلم, meditate upon the bounties of God, but not on God himself, his essence. For God is about and beyond all possibility of being described in terms of any form, in a surah. This basic idea is expressed in a number of sayings, one can meditate on the attributes of God but not on the essence. No powers of conception have any access to this essence. In Islamic terms, therefore, the ultimate reality is utterly inconceivable. That which is conceivable cannot be the ultimate reality as such. It can only be a self-disclosure of that reality. The Buddhist might see here that at the very summit of Islamic metaphysics there is an application of the first shahada, la ilaha illallah, which harmonizes with the Buddhist insistence on the void, the shunya, being beyond name and form, and by that very token beyond all conceivability. 
And both traditions could agree on the following paraphrase of the Shahada. No conceivable form, only the inconceivable essence. Now Allah is of course understood to comprise diverse qualities or attributes. Many of these attributes will be quite alien, indeed incomprehensible in terms of the Buddhist intellectual tradition. But when attention is directed to some of the essential attributes of God, such as al-haq, the real or the true, then it becomes possible to discern further common ground between the two faiths on the transcendent plane. The name al-haq indeed has strong resonances with the term dharma. For in Arabic the word haq comprises not only the ideas of truth and reality, but also that of right, that which is due. Therefore the notions of duty, law and propriety are also implied in this polyvalent concept. Such notions also go into the heart of the meaning of dharma. However, at the highest level the dharma is also identified with absolute truth, with absolute reality both in the earliest texts of the Pali Canon and the later Mahayana texts. Here I'd like to emphasize the importance of the claim made by the late scholar of Buddhism, Marco Pallas. Quote, If Dharma corresponds on the one hand to the absoluteness and infinitude of essence, the dharmas, for their part, in the plural, correspond to the relativity and contingency of the accidents. The Dharma can thus be understood in two distinct senses, one philosophical or ontological and the other pedagogical or practical. In the first sense it refers to what Islamic thought understands as the essence of that, absolute reality. All particular essences are relative in theological terms or illusory, spiritual terms. In the pedagogical or practical sense, the Dharma as teaching law, norm, etc., can be seen to correspond to the Sharia, exoterically, and the Tariqa, esoterically. Taken together in both senses, ontological and practical, the single term Dharma in Buddhism might be seen to correspond approximately to the ternary in Islam, al haqiqa al tariqa al sharia essential reality, spiritual path, religious law. Going back to the relationship between the absolute dharma and relative dharmas, one observes that this distinction is mirrored in Islam by the relationship between the face, al-wajj, the face of God, and faces, wujuh, essences of relative beings. In the Qur'an, God's face is identified with that which alone is eternal, in contradistinction to all else which is transient. Everything is perishing, except his face, kullu shayn halikun illa wajha, verse 88 of Surah Al-Qasas. The interpretation of this verse by Al-Ghazali brings out well the metaphysical affinity between the notions of waj and dharma. It is not, he says, that each thing is perishing at one time or at other times, but that it is perishing from eternity, without beginning to eternity without end. It can only be conceived thus when the essence of anything other than him is considered in respect of its own essence. When the essence of anything other than him is considered in respect of its own essence, it is sheer non-existence. But when it is viewed in respect of the face to which existence flows forth from the first, the real, then it is seen as existing not in itself, but through the face, turned to its giver of existence. Hence, the only existent is the face of God. Then he makes this extremely important point, which helps us to understand the subtlety of what's being said in this verse. Except his face can also re refer to the face of the thing. Everything is perishing except the face of the thing, insofar as that face is faced towards the one and only face, that of God. He says, Each thing has two faces, a face toward itself and a face toward its Lord. Viewed in terms of the face of itself, toward itself it is non-existent. But viewed in terms of the face of God, 
it exists. Hence nothing exists but God and his face. This is from the Mishkat al-Anwar. We're reminded here of one of the most important principles of Mahayana Buddhism, expressed as follows in the Diamond Sutra. Selfless are all dharmas. They do not have the character of living beings. They are without soul, without personality. The dharma is therefore absolute plenitude in its own suchness, what's called in Buddhism its own tathata. But from the point of view of the apparent suchness of the world, it appears to be empty. It's empty of all the illusory suchnesses of things, so that being empty of emptiness is infinite plenitude. When applied to absolute reality, the same term dharma implies an emptiness which, as it were, fills the emptiness of all other dharmas. Relativity is first stripped of its separative existence and then re-endowed with reality. In Islamic terms one might say, first comes the nafi, la ilaha, no divinity, reality, essence, then the ithbat, the negation, followed by the affirmation. No divinity, no reality, no essence, except the one divinity, the one reality, the one essence. Again, in Buddhist terms, no dharma, only the dharma, la ilaha illallah. The conceptual convergence at this level of tawhid is evident. Now the doctrine of the emptiness or unreality of all dharmas leads us directly to the Islamic principle of tawhid as mystically realized through fana or extinction. Going back to Mishkat al-Anwar, Al-Ghazali describes the state of those who have attained true extinction, those who are neither conscious of themselves nor conscious of their unconsciousness. This state, he says, is called unification, ittihad in metaphorical terms, but tawheed according to the language of reality. This state of extinction is the metaphysical foundation for the ultimate assertion or realization of oneness which is what the word Tawheed literally means. Making one, realizing one, and not just declaring one. The oneness in question therefore eludes any simplistic, verbal, logical or numerical definition. It has to be realized if its true meaning is to be attained. And this realization in turn is predicated on complete self-effacement. Such considerations might help us to discern the aim behind the paradoxical nature of many Buddhist teachings. They appear to be governed by the imperative of inducing that self-effacement, anatta, no self, from which enlightenment flows. Such teachings should therefore be read in the light of the chasm which flows, which separates, sorry, the description of things from the reality glimpsed or consummated through enlightenment. The puzzling paradoxes will then be grasped as inevitable shadows cast on the plane of thought by that which deconstructs all thought, which negates the limitations of specific ego-centered consciousness. Thought has to give way to being. To quote the Avatamsaka Sutra, mental fabrication must give way to a state of enlightened being. One hears an echo here of the Buddha's teaching on the need to be stripped of all thought coverings, achitta avarana. Thought, by its very nature, covers and thus obscures the source or substance or root of its own consciousness. According to the Heart Sutra, a bodhisattva dwells without thought coverings, and in the end he attains the nirvana. Al-Ghazali again provides us with an analogous formulation referring not to thought coverings but to individual faculties. The highest spiritual sciences are ma'arif, plural of ma'arifa. These are only revealed to the individual, he says, through spiritual states of unveiling, mukashafa, which in turn are predicated upon the extinction of the individual's consciousness. 
Fana is the essential prerequisite of this unveiling because, quote, the contingencies of the ego, together with its passions, exert an attraction toward the sensible world, which is a world of error and illusion. Fana refers to a state wherein all the senses are pacified, not preoccupied, and the imagination is in repose, not generating confusion. It's from the Kitab al -Arbaim. From this state of fana flows the station of baqa, the subsistence of the individual soul, subsequent to mystical extinction. The individual is now sustained, not by its own face or essence, but through the one and only reality. In analogous mode, the Diamond Sutra tells us that the enlightened ones are sustained not by themselves, but by the pure absolute. Again, we return to this important notion, the non-compound, the asamskrita, which you referred to earlier in the Udana citation. To quote from the Diamond Sutra, an absolute, this is Edward Conzer's translation, an absolute, capital A, exalts the holy persons. Asamskrita prabhavita hi arya pudgala. This view of the enlightened ones is very similar to the classic definition in Islam of the saint, the friend of God, the Waliullah, whose entire being is likewise sustained by God, as expressed in the following holy utterance, the Hadith Qudsi. My slave never ceases to draw near to me through supererogatory acts until I love him. And when I love him, I am his hearing by which he hears, his sight by which he sees, his hand by which he grasps, and his foot by which he walks. Turning now to the question of worship. Alongside all of the obvious differences between Islam and Buddhism, let's take note of the proximity of the two, two, tradition, two traditions in respect of what is regarded in Islam as the very core of worship, namely the remembrance of God, dhikrullah. Here, the analogies found between Islamic spiritual praxis and the Mahayana school are striking. More specifically, in the Japanese Pure Land School, founded by Honen in the 12th century, the name of the Buddha of infinite light, Amitabha, Amida in Japanese, is invoked. And this invocation is regarded as the most direct path to salvation. Here, the Buddha of infinite light assumes the role of saviour and is invoked as such. One is saved by Amida by being resurrected after death in his pure land, the Sukhavati, paradise of bliss, descriptions of which closely resemble those of the Quranic paradise. This salvific grace is the result of the vows taken by Dharmakara according to the Sutra of Eternal Life the Chinese translation of which formed the basis of the Shin school within Pure Land Buddhism, both in China and in Japan, where it became known as Jodo Shin. The question may be asked, how can we compare the invocation of the name Allah with the invocation of a name of the Buddha, a mere man? We would reply by saying that what is being invoked is not the human form of the Buddha, known as Nirmana Kaya, nor the cosmic archetype of the Buddha, Sampogakaya, but the Dharmakaya, the Absolute. One name of this Absolute is Amitabha, infinite light, a light which both enlightens and saves. It is as if the two Islamic names of God, An-Nur and Ar-Rahim, were synthesized and invoked as a single name. This becomes clearer when we look at the mythological account of the saving vow of Amida, the vow taken by the Bodhisattva, Dharmakara, not to enter final enlightenment until every being has attained enlightenment, this vow being, one might say, the basis of the idea of the Bodhisattva, which defines Mahayana Buddhism. The Buddha speaks of having attained Buddhahood in the infinitely distant past, ten kalpas ago, each kalpa being 432 million years. Here the number of years is clearly symbolic. 
we're being invited to enter into a timeless domain, a distant past or origin, a pre-eternity, referred to in Islam as al-azal. This pre-eternity is at one, of course, with post-eternity, al-abad, or simply being eternity as such. So what is being alluded to, I would argue, in these references to the unimaginable past is in fact an eternal principle, above and beyond time. This primordial or original Buddha is also referred to as the Adi Buddha, a surname for the Dharmakaya, the Absolute. If the Adi Buddha is the origin of all things, it can correspond to what Muslims refer to in terms of the divine name Al-Awwal, the first. Metaphysically, the first must also be the last, Al-Akhir. Alpha and Omega are in principle identical and can be distinguished as first and last only from the point of view of time itself. In themselves, they are not other than complementary expressions of the principle of eternity transcending time altogether. All of this is succinctly expressed by the late Kenryo Kanamatsu, author of what is already being called a classic Jodo work, Naturalness, written in the English language. And this word is his own. Uh, he, he coined it himself. He comments on the word of Shakyamuni, in which he describes his primordial enlightenment. Quote, This is the eternal I am that speaks through the I am that is in me. The Buddha is thus speaking not as an individual or on his own behalf, but as the mouthpiece or transmitter of a universal reality. His enlightenment, eons ago, is a mythical way of referring to enlightenment as such, or the source of all enlightenment, light as such. Hence, as Kanematsu says, Amida, the infinite being, is perfect and eternal. In respect of the vow taken by Amida not to enter enlightenment until all beings are saved, this can be understood in terms of universal principles, abstracted from their mythological context. To quote again from Kanamatsu, Amida is heart of our hearts. He is the all-feeling, compassionate heart. Amida is the eternal saving will, the eternally working original vow. This compassionate vow, normally expressed as a vow not to enter final enlightenment until all beings are saved, can be seen as analogous to the metaphor used by God in the Qur'an to describe His mercy. Your Lord has written mercy upon His own self. Also to be noted in this connection is the verse, Call upon Allah or Call upon Ar-Rahman, the All-Compassionate. One sees here that the intrinsic nature of the Absolute is saving compassion. The invocation of the name of the Absolute, Amitabha, is thus absolutely salvific. It might also be noted that the Prophet of Islam expressed a sentiment analogous to the vow of Amida, alluding to his prerogative to intercede for sinners. In relation to the verse of the Quran which says, and your Lord shall give you and you will be content. Verse number 5, Surah number 93, he said, I shall not be content for as long as a single member of my community is in the fire. And given that the Prophet ﷺ was sent as a mercy to the whole of creation, verse 107, Surah 21, his community can be interpreted to mean all peoples and even all beings, as in the vow of Amida, and not just Muslims in the narrow sense of the word. It would be appropriate here to explore further the way in which the principle of mercy helps to reveal common ground between Islam and Buddhism. As I mentioned at the outset, it was to this principle that the Dalai Lama specifically referred in his affirmation that Muslims do indeed follow a path of salvation insofar as they offer, they offer complete submission to the universal ideal of compassion. The principle of compassion is perfectly embodied in Gautama the Sage and yet this principle must be seen as infinitely transcending his empirical individuality. 
As he says in a Mahayana text called Vajracheddika, those who by my form did see me and those who followed me by my voice, wrong are the efforts they engaged in. Me, those people will not see. From the Dharma one should see the Buddha. One does not see the Buddha apart from the Dharma. One begins with the Dharma and then proceeds to see the Buddha in the light thereof. The compassion proper to the Dharma is universal. Gautama the sage manifested this quality in one particular modality. This relationship between the particular and the universal is expressed in Buddhism by means of the mythology of cosmic Buddhas existing in unimaginably distant eons prior to the earthly appearance of the Gautama as we've just noted. Mahayana texts therefore present a picture which resembles a quote personal God with diverse traits the Adi Buddha, Vairochana, Amitabha etc without whose grace and mercy one cannot attain salvation into the pure land. It's clear that Mahayana Buddhism comes close to the Islamic conception of divinity as regards the root of the quality of compassion and both make explicit a metaphysically irrefutable principle again one about which the Buddha himself was silent but which he did not contradict compassion cannot be exhausted by its, hewly, by its purely human manifestation on the contrary it derives all its power and efficacy from its superhuman absolute or divine source. The source is transcendent, but in so far as it radiates towards all creatures, it assumes what we might call a personal dimension, for it consists of an active, conscious and loving will to save all creatures. And to speak of such a will is to speak of some kind of person directing that will. In one respect then this can be seen as a personalization or personification of the Absolute, bestowing upon the pure, ineffable Absolute a personal or anthropomorphic dimension, a dimension without which it cannot enter into engagement with human persons. For the pure Absolute has no relation whatsoever with any conceivable relativity. However, this personal dimension does not in any way diminish the absoluteness of the Absolute. For the manifestation of such qualities as compassion, love and mercy does not exhaust the nature of the principle thus manifested. In Islamic terms, the Absolute is the essence, transcending those names and qualities which are assumed by the Absolute in its relationship with the world. The transcendence of the essence above and beyond the world goes hand in hand with the radiance of the attributes of the essence in the world. In other words, there is no contradiction between asserting, on the one hand, that the essence of God infinitely transcends all conceivable personal qualities, and on the other, that God assumes these personal qualities for the sake of entering into compassionate, enlightening and saving relationship with his creatures. This Islamic synthesis of complementary perspectives helps to demonstrate that what has been called Mahayana theism in no way compromises early Buddhism's insistence on the transcendence of the Dhamma, the Nirvana Shunya, vis-à-vis -vis all conceivable qualities. Islamic metaphysics also helps to answer the question which might be posed to a Buddhist. What is the connection between the principle of unity in terms of which there appears to be no other and the quality of compassion which logically presupposes both an agent and a recipient of compassion thus a duality from the point of view of Islamic metaphysics the oneness of reality strictly implies compassion for the oneness of God is not simply exclusive it's also inclusive as al-Ahad all exclusive oneness, God's unity transcends all things. But as al-Wahid, all inclusive oneness, 
God's unity encompasses all things. Whence such divine names as Al-Wasir, the infinitely capacious, and Al-Muhit, the all-encompassing. And it's from this all-embracing dimension of divine reality that compassion springs. For it's not just as being or knowledge, presence or imminence that God encompasses all, it is also as Rahmah. My Rahmah encompasses all things, the Quran tells us, verse 156, surah number 7. The creative aspect of the divine Rahmah is vividly brought home to us in the chapter entitled Ar-Rahman, surah 55. It's Ar-Rahman who taught the Quran, created man, taught him discernment, verses 1 to 3. And the whole of this chapter evokes and invokes the reality of this quintessential quality of God. The blessings of paradise are described here in the most majestic terms, but so too are the glories, the beauties and the harmonies of God's entire cosmos, including the wonders of virgin nature. These verses being musically punctuated by the refrain, so which of, your, of the favours of your Lord can you deny? In this chapter, we're invited to contemplate the various levels at which Brahma fashions the substance of reality. The Rahma that describes the deepest nature of the divine, the Rahma that is musically inscribed into the very recitation of the chapter, the Rahma that creates all things, the Rahma that reveals itself through the Quran, through all the signs of nature, and thereby one comes to see that God has created not only by Rahma, from Rahma, but also created all things for Rahma. Except those upon whom God has mercy, for this did he create them. The end of verse 119, surah number 11. These reflections help to demonstrate that in Islam, God's Rahma is not just mercy. Rather, it is the infinite love and overflowing beatitude of ultimate reality, one of whose manifestations is mercy. In this light, one can better appreciate such perspectives as the following, again within Jodoshin Buddhism. The inner truth is this, from the eternal love do all beings have their birth. Such a statement articulates a dimension of causality left completely out of account by the earlier Buddhist scriptures, where, as we saw earlier, the entire emphasis was on escape from the round of births and deaths. In Mahayana Buddhism, however, one finds expressions of love and compassion which are identified with the creative power of the Absolute. This passage from Kanamatsu's Naturalness shows that the Absolute reveals its, quote, eternal life through the dimension of its great compassion. Amida is the supreme spirit from which all spiritual revelations grow and to whom all personalities are related. Amida is at once the infinite light and the eternal life, Amitayus. He is at once the great wisdom, the infinite light and the great compassion, Mahakaruna. The great compassion is creator, he says, while the great wisdom contemplates. Some lines later we read about the unitive power of love. This can be compared with the compassionate love which is spiritually required and logically implied by the metaphysics of Tawheed. In love, he writes, the sense of difference is obliterated and the human heart fulfills its inherent purpose in perfection, transcending the limits of itself and reaching across the threshold of the spirit world. In love, then, the sense of difference is obliterated. The unity of being, which may be conceptually understood through knowledge, is spiritually realized through love, whose infinite creativity overflows into a compassion, whose most merciful act is to reveal this very oneness. To return to Al-Ghazali, the perfect and eternal love of God creates the human being in a disposition which ever seeks proximity to him, furnishes him with access to the pathways leading to the removal of the veils separating him from God, such that he comes to see God by means of God himself, referring back to the Hadith Qudsi. Quote, 
And all this is the act of God, a grace bestowed upon the creature. And such is what is meant by God's love of the creature. End of quote. This enlightening grace of God towards his creatures is constitutive of God's love for them. A love which in reality is nothing other than his love for himself. When the Quran asserts that he loves them, verse 54 of Surah number 5, this means, according to Al-Ghazali, that God does indeed love them, all human souls, but in reality he loves nothing other than himself, in the sense that he is, God is the totality of being, and there is nothing in being apart from him. Human love and compassion, by means of which the sense of difference is obliterated between self and other, can thus be seen as a unitive reflection, here below, of the oneness of the love that God has for himself, both within himself and through all beings as himself. Boundless compassion and transcendent oneness, far from being mutually exclusive, are thus harmoniously integrated according to this metaphysical application of Tawheed. Inward beatitude qualifying the one and outward compassion integrating the many. Certain verses, I'm concluding here now, certain verses of the great poet saint of Tibet, Milarepa, shed light on the common ground between these two traditions of Islam and Buddhism as regards the spiritual mystery of this oneness that implies compassion. Milarepa sings as follows Without realizing the unity of bliss and void, even though on the void you may meditate, you practice only nihilism. The void, therefore, is intrinsically blissful, or else it is not the true void. Nirvana and the void are essentially one. The term nirvana reveals the blissful nature of the state wherein one is extinguished in the absolute and the void stresses the objective nature of the absolute transcending all things that are full, full that is a false being. Milarepa's verses make clear that it's precisely because the void is overflowing with beatitude that the experience of the void cannot but be blissful. It's far from, from a nihilistic negation of existence and thought. Knowing and experiencing the beatitude of the void thus cannot but engender in the soul a state of being reflecting this beatitude, together with a wish to share that beatitude with all beings. Such a wish manifests the very essence of compassion. One not only has the capacity to feel the suffering of others as one's own, one also has an aspiration to bring that suffering to an end through showing others the path to the mercy and felicity abundantly overflowing from ultimate reality. This is the message which should be immediately intelligible to any Muslim of the following verses of Milarepa. If in meditation you still tend to strive, try to arouse for all a great compassion. Be identified with the All-Merciful. To identify with the All-Merciful is to identify with the Absolute. Arousing for all what he calls a great compassion means infusing into one's soul a quality which reflects the infinite compassion of the Absolute. One from whom compassion flows to all is one in whom the overflowing void compassion, as he calls it in another verse, has been realized. It ceaselessly overflows from the Absolute to the Relative, and to the extent that one has made oneself void for its sake, one becomes a vehicle for the radiation of the compassion of the void. He says, Rechumpa, listen to me for a moment. From the center of my heart stream glowing beams of light. This shows the unity 
of mercy and the void. End of the verses. This description could well apply to those whom the Quran calls the slaves of the All Compassionate, Ibad al Rahman. Those slaves who are so totally identified with the fountain of the divine essence, al Kafur, that according to the Quran, the more they drink therefrom, the more abundantly it flows. <coughs> Verses 5 to 6, the Surah Al Insan, Surah number 76. According to the Sufi commentator Al Kashani, these slaves are the ones from whom the veil of egoity, Ana'iya, has been removed, and through whom, therefore, the graces of God flow abundantly throughout the cosmos. They are the ones who, by the perfection of their love, born of self-effacement, manifest the most dazzling evidence of the true nature, the true compassion of the One.